Welcome everybody inside the Blackwood Broadcasting Studios at an undisclosed institute of higher learning. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're happy to have all of you along with us today. Along the way on this bus to Never Never Land, the spirits have helped bring me closer to my native seed. The ability at 32 years old to begin to harness my passion for music with my broadcasting prowess. This is not to say that the journey has not been winding, laborious, and full of lessons. Still, there are moments when you realize what you are doing is painting a picture of Americana. Mexico is the country south of the United States, and it's in the biggest of cities, Mexico City, that my guest started his life. He was around the conga drum as the city itself was thriving amongst the mix of Afro-Cuban, bossa, and native rhythms. Upon returning to the States as a kid, my guest wound up living one block away from Bob Weir. While they never played music as kids, it was the initial connection that would be amplified later on. Before Kingfish, the British gigs, and partying with Brent Midland, my guest had to stand out. He had to get up at an all-black club, the kind that this host fantasizes about, and play his harmonica. The blues leaders of the day in the South Bay were the likes of Clifford Coulter, Johnny Carswell, and Mel Brown. One day in San Diego, I walked into a record shop and noticed this Mel Brown LP. And when I looked at the personnel, there was my guest on Impulse, late 60s, and at that point, the intersection had occurred. Taking chances has been my guest's whole life. Putting his best intentions forward, willing to see a spark of creativity, and also succumbing to the harmony of the underworld. He has traveled and lived in some of the most spiritual places, including India, Thailand, and the old blues club Popeyes in San Jose. And my guest continues to enlighten for those who care to be enlightened. Might as well get hypnotized. Matthew Kelly, welcome. To the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you for having me. Welcome to to everybody out there, and uh, you'll have to excuse me. I I just flew in from. I'm in Thailand now. I just flew in from the states, and and uh, as I explained to Jake, uh, just prior to my to my uh, getting on board, I cracked a couple of ribs to boot. So uh, I'm just gonna uh, see how this thing flows. It going to be interesting but uh um yeah it's it's great to be here and and uh um what weather wise uh, we is it uh sizzling hot in, in tucson because well, you know it, it's uh we've had a very tepid monsoon season um normally uh well in the past if you lived here long enough we, we used to have pretty consistent monsoon seasons during this time but it's very humid there's not a lot of rain, and it is very, very hot. In fact, I had a bunch of uh, javelinas, which are like these big boars, and they wound up um, uh, a family of them, like a mother and father and, uh, and uh, an older son or daughter, and then two babies were in uh, our flower uh, uh, bed uh, sleeping uh, the other day because it was <laughs> because it was so hot and they don't there's, there's not a lot of water so it's but you know t- to be honest with you uh, Tucson to me Matt I mean I um you know I my, I was brought here uh, you know for a reason and uh, Tucson has been an extremely important and beautiful place uh, my whole life has changed and actually as I as I sit here my eight year old daughter is sitting next to me witnessing this interview with you. So it's really an honor um, to talk to you. But I, I, you know, I wanted to start, uh, I, 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 I love the, uh, you know, I've interviewed so many guys, uh, a lot of the Afro-Cuban percussionists, Candido and Ray Mantilla and Warren Smith and Joe, guys that just lived uh, with the conga drum. And I was, I was really quite surprised and, and delighted to know that you started, that was your, really your first instrument in Mexico City. And I'd love to, for you to talk about what kind of sounds you were hearing and, uh, and how you started, how you picked up that instrument. Well, it's, it's, I didn't know that uh, very many people knew uh, that I played the conga drums at all. And so it's a surprise, Jake, to hear you uh, uh, talking about this because, uh, but how it started is, um, uh, I drove, uh, with my father and he had a business trip in, 
in Mexico City. So he asked if I wanted to come along, and I said, sure. So we, we, we drove from San Francisco the full length of Mexico and, and lived for four months in, in, in Mexico and in, in all over Mexico. And along the way, uh, I met some fascinating young musicians uh and uh not just musicians but uh uh just uh, amazing uh human beings mm-hmm. and and so that really that really opened things up my whole life changed at that point i i i hadn't played um any any musical instrument prior to that and uh uh i i, I had wanted to play the piano um and um uh, but it just didn't come to pass, and uh, I, and so, um, but there, here I was in Mexico, and and um, and with these uh, wonderful uh, Mexican kids, and 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 they started teaching me stuff, and we just uh, it just it was a blast, and uh, um, so. Uh, so that's that's how I just I just started playing with him and uh, and I played uh, uh, conga drums actually with um, various different bands that I I don't even remember the names of them now <laughs> uh, of the bands uh, but uh, they they were good bands and I mean you know, that was my main thing that was my main gig is it wasn't harp it wasn't guitar it was conga drums and and. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't know that, so that's why I'm really surprised to hear you talking well, about Well, no, because, but I, but I mean, part, I mean, listen, I, you know, after 300 interviews and a lot of them with, uh, you know, with guys that, you know, from, the, that came from the traditions of guys like Dizzy Gillespie, who, who introduced Chano Pozo, and, you know, just today I, I find a George Shearing record with Armando Peraza. Uh, you know, the drum has been a central, the hand drum especially has been a central theme to my show, so... And then I saw, I mean, amazingly enough, you know, this is, you know, pushing forward too much. But, uh, yeah, I mean, seeing you uh, in the, in the, with the, uh, the Bobby and the Midnight's group playing, yeah. playing conga drums with Billy Cobham on drums. <laughs> I was, I was, I was like, this is, this is, but I don't want to go there just yet. Because to be honest with you, this is like, you know, it's one of these things where you, uh, there's just too much uh, other stuff. But, I, you know, the, the question I have is. Were you were there just were you getting involved with drum circles? Were they playing like because because me, traditional Mexican music is more like mariachi music as opposed to you know the stuff that was the islands you know the Afro Cuban the bossa rhythms the and and the and the and I was curious as to you know when you talk about the Mexican kids what were you listening to and then what were you were you these guys just jamming? Yes, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I. Uh, I don't know who the names of the people. You know, they were they would they put put on you know records and play guys, and we'd listen to them. And and uh, I, I, I I never to be honest with you, I I I don't even know the names of these people. And uh, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when we did the first further festival, you know, Mickey Hart put that. Uh, um, Group together with a whole bunch of famous percussionists, including Zakir Hussain, you know, and um, from India, and doing, and but from all different cultural backgrounds. And then he had this guy from Cuba, and uh, I, I, I'm once again I'm embarrassing myself because he was. Uh, everyone told me he was he was the world's best conga drum player, and and um, it must have been uh, Candido. It was Candido, and it was, uh, and I've interviewed Zakir as well. I mean, no, that's the point: is that the tabla and the and the conga and the bongos. I mean, that stuff, the rhythms. It's just so beautiful because I I have to believe that, um, uh, you know, it it gave you those those rudiments and allowed you to pick up other instruments. Did the drum? Did those? Did that conga drum help you in your playing of the harp and the guitar? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm uh, uh, the way I approach music, and maybe it's, it it started because of uh, my affiliation with with hand drums and such. Um, but my approach to any instrument I play, whether it's uh, 
guitar or harp or anything is very rhythmic. Uh, I'm one of the few harmonica players that play with a uh, rhythm harp. And uh, and I remember Weary used to say, he said, one of the things that he loved about my harp playing was he said, he said, you're the only guy I've ever heard that plays rhythm, you know, <laughs> and, 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 right. and, I, and, and like there, there's a song uh, on our first album called By and By. Uh, you will understand it better by and by. It's a, it's an old traditional Cuban kind of uh, uh, spiritual song. And it's got great lyrics and, and, and I play harp on that, and I play uh, m- mostly uh, sort of a rhythm type uh, uh, part all the way through. In, in the middle, I do a solo, and it's it's it, it, it's got a really nice effect on on the harp, and it sounds it's a it's a cool part. It's very different sounding. It's not your traditional, you know, bluesy kind of thing. I I as much as I love the blues, I uh, you know I. I didn't want to get stuck in that rut um, for forever, and so I w- I wanted to experiment with different with with different things. And and as I said, you know, it comes back to rhythm again. You know, uh, I was attracted to to things that that were rhythmically interesting, and um, so. Anyway, no, yeah. no, but I, I mean, this is it, to me. It was, it was so appropriate because, uh, you know, whether it's, I just, you know, I, there's just been. I mean, I interviewed Bobby. It's been, you know, Greg Rico and 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 Tony Saunders and Bill Vitt and uh, all these heavy, heavy dudes from the you know, the heliport scene and the and the and, and yet, you know, with you, the South Bay. Uh, was uh, in itself had its own scene. I just interviewed uh, <laughs> Clifford Clifford Coulter, uh, and 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 you know that cat is like. I mean, they're do- he's doing like a, he's having a big celebration for his, uh, uh, you know, for uh, I, I don't know what the ceremony is all about, but Chester Thompson from Tower of Power is coming over, and I'm like, Matt Kelly was in that scene, and then I'm reading this story, and to me, it epitomizes the story that I've wanted any one of my musicians to tell. And that was the idea of you and your friends when you move back to California, the idea of, uh, you know, saying, yo, we're, let's go check out some hip music. Just the way Ed Neumeister would go to the Black Saint and see Gaylord Birch. You guys, right. you guys were like, yo, we're going, let's go check out a club. And you got there and you just, at one point, were like, you know, I'm not interested in just sitting around and listening. I want to play. And it took a lot of balls to do that, and sure enough, it it paid major dividends. And I would just love you. To talk, I'd love you to talk to my audience about that that night, and then. Amazing. And, uh, and sure. One, yeah, please. That that, that night uh, uh, virtually uh, changed my whole life because you know, as a, as a kid, uh, I was always you know very attracted to the blues, and and I, I was the only one of uh, my friends uh, who was into that. They they were all listening to the standard, you know, rock and roll and Chuck Berry and uh, and all and all this stuff. And, and some of that stuff was way cool. There's no doubt about it. But there was nobody that was listening to uh, Bobby Blue Bland and, and which, uh, um, uh, I don't know if you know, but Mel Brown was a guitar player for, for Bobby Blue Bland. I didn't know that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was living in New Orleans, in um, uh, <clears throat> in Mel, they were doing oh, opening for Jackie Wilson, and uh, Mel's plane uh, got canceled, and so the band didn't show up. And there I was backstage with his classic scene with uh, Bobby Blue Bland, and he had a bottle of whiskey and he was just so depressed that his band wasn't there because he had a big band and his, he, he didn't do just straight 12 bar blues. He did very complicated stuff. He was a real, I don't know how much you know about Bobby Lubin, but he, he just died recently. That's right. Um, and he was a real master performer. And, and, and so he, his, his, his band and, and the, 
the orchestration and everything was they were, everything was so professionally worked out and that uh, they said well we'll get uh, uh, the other band to uh, what, what, who did I just mention um, uh, um, it was Mel Brown Bobby Blue Bland uh, and um, oh, my heart my heart lonely tears uh, that uh, anyway yeah. anyway who he it was opening um, so uh, 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 it, it, it turned out that they, they wanted that band to open for him, and he just uh, and then he started telling me sto- stories, and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me that Mel didn't show up because I got to because uh, Bobby Blue Band was one of my uh, biggest heroes of all time, and so I got to hear his life story. It was just him and. and it's just the two of us in this dressing room, and he was sitting there, and and he told me that there was uh, Mel Brown was there's there was no other guitar player on the planet that he'd rather play with than Mel for his style. He said Mel's the guy, you know, and uh, he's going on and on and and but anyway, in, in terms of the story of how I met Brown, Mel, uh, there was I'd heard about this club called the Exit in East Palo Alto, and it was a little. It was all, it was dangerous and and for white kids to go down there and and most people didn't do it and and uh, me and a buddy uh, decided we take the plunge and go on down there and <laughs> uh, I brought brought some harps and I didn't really think I would play and uh, uh, I, I, I'm not much of a drinker I had a couple of glasses of wine and and. Uh, and uh, a Valium. I remember this uh, distinctly. And that'll put and, yeah, that, that'll put you in an elevated state, no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, and it just loosened me up enough because although I was pretty shy uh, in in my early days with music, there's no way I would have done it otherwise. And all of a sudden, they started off with you know Johnny was just you know a master of of the Hammond and the B3, and they didn't even have a bass player. Johnny was kicking bass. You know, off the Hammond. With Absolutely. His feet, you know, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, you, know, you know, like Clifton in this that style that that very few people play, and and so uh, I just I I don't know what came over me. It was like a man possessed. Uh, I just jumped up on stage. Uh, I knew what key they were in. I just started playing along, and uh, my friend looked at me like like you're out of your mind and he was trying it. to stop me. And, and anyway, I, fi- I finally started playing and, and uh, uh, to make a long story short, you know, uh, uh, it went over really, really well. I was on and um, after the show, um, Mel said, he, he said, listen, um, I'm going down in two days to L.A. to make a record. And... Uh, he said, "How would you like to come down and live, stay at my house and watch, and and um, make the record with me?" And I, my jaw just dropped because here's one of my all-time heroes. And what I, the other thing I didn't realize, and a lot of people don't under, know about Mel Brown, was he was kind of like the Jerry Garcia of the black, uh, the black scene, an underground scene. And even though he, Mel never drank and he never did drugs, but he he would when he played guitar he would just be in his own world. He, I mean, live he was he was like Jerry. It, it, he didn't come off as well um, on record, but live he was uh, transformational. Okay, I want to I want to. This is very important. So you, when you're saying in a live setting, he would just hit the sequencing of ideas. His solos would go on, and it would just absolutely. Unbelievable. You know, and I actually, on this album that you speak of, I'd rather suck my thumb. I actually, it's funny because I was listening when I was going to interview Clifford. I was like, you know, I got to find some organ solos. And I didn't really find any because Mel just had so much to say. He just, domi- you know, and then you were on there, but it was, I would have loved to have seen that live. But I think it's so important for younger musicians, younger younger people trying to. I didn't know what I was doing. Well, no, but that's the point. I mean, that's the point is that people think that they're like, we need to have some kind of, there needs to be some linear pattern to move forward and everything needs to make sense. But the idea of you 
standing up, taking chance, taking a chance Boy, like that. Think. And then Mel, but then Mel, Mel's like, wow, look at this cat. I'm going to bring him to L.A. I mean, it speaks to the humanity of, of, of Mel Brown. And when I, when I walked into this record shop a few months ago, I said, you know, I don't know where Matt is, but I sure need to find him because this is, this is, this is starting to put the puzzle pieces back together again uh, about stuff that I never even knew existed. And, and actually, uh, we got a treat for you. I want to throw this track in right now. Uh, I don't even remember what the, what it sounds like. Well, what, what what, I well set, settle in, my friend, and uh, and we'll come back and uh, and we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> give uh, kudos to my uh, engineer Jim Blackwood who uh, who just transferred that from vinyl to digital while we were talking and so that oh, fantastic. <laughs> you know that's uh, that tune is uh, called Scorpio and uh, and that's off uh, Mel Brown's famous album on impulse I'd rather suck my thumb with the harpist Matt Kelly and I mean I, I that it just sounds so warm you know <laughs> it's beautiful mm. Well, thank you. You know, I, I, that session, it was the first um, record I, that, that I recall. I, I think I'd done uh, some kind of rinky-dink recording, but nothing like that. And and remember, when I got up to play, Mel just said, uh, he said, he's basically taught me, uh, about jamming. He's, because he said, man, because see, what, what, uh, was there it was already down and so it's like he just said uh it's, it's like he so i i didn't know quite, quite as you can tell there's there's not a lot of structure there there's no there's no rhythm guitar it's just a, a lead uh and there's the there's the, there's the keyboard and then there's uh the drummer and myself and they they just told me mel just told me he said man just play just just play. play anything, just play whatever you, whatever you feel, you know. And, and he just went, went on and on, and and uh, he he made me made me feel so relaxed. And, and and like I said, I was living in his house in in Watts, and uh, um, I got to tell the story of how I got into um, the the whole blue scene, the Chitlin circuit, and all that was through this whole. Event. This is what led to uh, change, changing my whole life because um, because Mel Brown was such a hero amongst in the black scene. Um, he he took me to these all black clubs in uh, in Watts mm. and 
and uh, he introduced me to Jimmy Witherspoon, T Bone Walker, uh, uh, a whole slew of people that I've been, you know, listening to since I was a kid. I, I couldn't believe it that you know I was meeting these guys, and and like I said, everyone was in awe of Mel. He he was like he had the bearing of a of a prince of an African prince, the way he carried himself. He was a very large man. And, uh, and so it was through him, I, you know, I was living in his house and I, I met all these fabulous people. And, and, uh, and as you probably know, then I later on ended up playing with, uh, uh, T-Bone Walker, which I, I don't know when we can talk about that whenever you want to. Um, when, I was curious but, when, when, when did, did you, uh, were you on some albums with him? Well, um, we were just getting ready to go into the studio to make an album, and um, uh, as fate would have it, he died of a heart attack three days before going into the studio. Oh, that's right. I and remember. Okay, right, right. It just broke my heart. And um, so, so if anybody out there is listening knows we did a show together called guitar explosion uh, in Berkeley. And I think it was at the Berkeley community theater, but I'm not sure. And it was put on by KPFA, you know, the famous uh, station there in right. Berkeley. And, uh, and they had the, the all time great jazz guitar players of all time. They had Kenny Burrell, Herb Ellis, um, Guys, uh, Kitty Bell, Herb Ellis. Um, I I can't remember all these guys' names, right. but they they were like the best, the best of the best at that time, and and all very famous um, of the more traditional jazz players. They backed up everybody, you know, uh, like and, Joe Pass too. Uh, yeah, sorry, Joe Pass Joe was Pat, there. Yeah, right. Yep, uh, and and uh, they decided to throw in. Um, a couple of blues artists because the because the blues and the jazz are closely affiliated affiliated and so um, uh, Shaggy Otis was the other blues artist and then they brought in a, an unknown kid by the name of Robin Ford. <laughs> wow! And Robin, uh, hmm. I have to say, he stole the show. Hmm. Um, he was unbelievable. Uh, and he, he, I mean, the, the reviews the next day and everything. But what, I, what I'm wondering is um, somebody had to have made a tape of that show. And, and because uh, these were like the super jazz guitar heroes of, of that era, of all, you know, the best there was. And um, I, I, I haven't been able to track anything down. And I'd, I'd give anything. I'd, I'd, I'd pay... Five grand for, for for two cuts. We're on it. We're on it. No, you know, you know. Here's the thing. Um, well, do, do you know the year exactly? Did you did you know that for a fa what year it was? Well, um, I'm. Let me see. This is so, a tough one. Uh, it had to have been. Uh, I can't give you the exact year. I'm really bad with with time sequence. Um, it was probably somewhere around 1971. You know how you can figure it out? Mm -hmm. Is if, if somebody can figure out uh, when T Bone died. Right. It was three, and it was, it was just a couple weeks before that? Or it was yes. that? Yes. Okay. It, it was just, I mean, not, if not a couple, it might have been maybe a month or two. But it, it, it was right around that time, that very much in that time frame. So if that, that was the year. And uh, I I would give anything. And we had um, a guy that was taping all our shows, really good quality. And um, uh, the guy didn't turn out to be a very nice guy. Uh, he, he stole them all, hmm. our whole collection. And at that time, we had a great backup band. We had uh, Caddy Cathcart, who's from Tuck and Patty, was our lead singer. We had um, uh, John, Johnny Carswell 
with our keyboard player. We had uh, um, Doobie Brothers, drummer. I mean, it was an all-star band. We did this thing. We'd come out and we'd do, uh, it was called, uh, uh, we called ourselves 33, so it was the all-new 33 review. And we'd, we'd do... Uh, uh, sort of R&B stuff, and then we bring it all right down, you know, like they do in in, in those R&B shows. And we say, now, ladies and gentlemen, like to bring on, you know, um, the the king, the king of the blues, and 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 BB King uh, gives him credit, uh, by the way, because I, I I played with with BB on the same bill, and and he told me he said. If it, if it weren't for for T Bone, he said I wouldn't be the guitar player I am today. He said I learned everything from T Bone, and I was I couldn't believe that. And um, so uh, anyway, uh, no, we'll listen. Long. We'll look for that. We we're on that. Okay, I mean, we're, and, and okay. we're, we're, we'll take care of you on that one. But I, I wanted to. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you. This is this is. Uh, I could barely contain my excitement. Um, but you know, this idea of this this uh, cavalcade of of musicians that uh, that were in uh, Palo Alto and the, and the South Bay and 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 uh, one of them. I mean, you 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 grew up as a as a kid when you moved back. You lived one block from Bobby Weir. And I, uh, to me, uh, I'm just like we went to school together. I'm like Matt Kelly and Bob Weir. You want to talk about two of the two pistols right there? What I mean, and I know that eventually Weir went off to, to uh, you went to one one school, one boarding school. He went to another one. Met John Perry Barlow, but that's uh, right. But yeah. but tell me about your relationship with Bobby. I mean, obviously you cranked out a lot of Poison Ivy, but were you were you were you wrestling in Poison Ivy? What were you doing back then? <laughs> Well, uh, if you're referring to the song and how that came about, I think that was just a, uh, you know, Bobby likes to get uh, quirky sometimes, and he'll pull out things out of a hat that uh, that are just kind of, uh, just to, um, uh, it's just Bobby, you know, Bobby has, has, that's what I love about Bobby. You never know what he's going to do or why. You know, he'll do something that will surprise everybody, and it, it, it maybe might not fit at all. Like, like in Rat Dog, we did. Uh, all of a sudden, we'd be doing, you know, uh, some Grateful Dead songs or this and that, and all of a sudden he'd start doing Misty, mm. you know, and we go, <laughs> "What? Where? What the hell are we? What is this all about?" And then Misty, you know, by Johnny Mathis. Many a days of night. You know that song? Sure. Yeah, and so, and I said, "No, wait a minute, Bobby, this is taking it too far." <laughs> but when so, you when you were, uh, I mean, you guys were just just friends. Bobby wasn't even a music; it wasn't playing music at that point either. When, before you guys went to separate ways to boarding schools, is that right? Uh, yep, he was a year behind me. We were on the same football team. Um, I was the captain of the football team, and and uh, he was a year behind me, and and um, and he, uh, we, I, the, my first memory of Bobby was even before we went to Menlo School, and it was, this, it was basically an area for it was where a lot of rich kids lived. And I, uh, embarrassed about it now, but that's that's where where we where, where we were mm-hmm. we in Atherton near Stanford University, and 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 um, and I I much I did, didn't really care for the school, nor did Bobby, and uh, we ended up I ended up getting shipped off to um, uh, uh, British boarding school in Canada, and Bobby ended up wherever he was with. Uh, Barlow and I'm not sure where that school was. I think it was like uh, Wyoming or something. Yeah, it could have been. It was why either Wyoming or there's one in Santa Barbara. Uh, I, I know what, Barlow's from Wyoming, but so you'd think it would be in Wyoming, but I don't think it's the one. I don't think it was Wyoming. But the, anyway, that it doesn't really matter. They they met in a different school, and and I think uh, it's one of the few boarding schools that Bobby didn't get kicked out of. Um, <laughs> so, so um, but you know, he, he was. Uh, but my first memory of, of Bobby is uh, 
uh, our, our parents apparently were friends. It was a close knit community and, uh, uh, they dropped me off. Uh, I, I didn't really know Bobby uh, that well, and, and they dropped me off at, at, at the Weir House, and it was on Halloween, and, and uh, that's when young kids go out and, and usually get in trouble, and Bobby was a real uh, troublemaker and, and um, in a fun kind of way, nothing, you know, terrible, mm-hmm. you know, nothing that would hurt anybody, but you know, just fun kind of uh, stuff uh, that kids do, and, and and so that was my first memory of Weir was Halloween, and uh, I, and we were really young, and I mean I, we had to have been, uh, you know, um, I'd say sixth grade. Well, when, the reason I bring it up is because when I interviewed Bobby, uh, one of the things we talked about was the idea that uh, he would go and visit the Reverend Gary Davis when he was in New York. And I just think that he must have, you, both of you guys were rooted in the blues, but when you guys linked back up, he must have been like, Matt, bo- Matt old boy, what, I mean, you've really done some, he must have been blown out of the water by where you, who you were playing with. I still don't think he knows all the people up there I play with, uh, <laughs> even to this day. Uh, well, that that um, I played, for, for one thing, before I forget it, um, I played with the oldest living blues artist alive, a guy named Furry Lewis. It's in the um, uh, uh, National, uh, what's that, uh, in, in, in Washington, D.C. There's something, uh, there's some organization for, uh, for these old guys. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, but he was like a National Archive uh, of... And he was one of the fir- the oldest. He was like 94, 95 years old, and um, almost impossible to play with. He was just a sweet, sweet man. But you know, his chord changes. He, there were no. You'd never know where what he was going to do because he 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 just uh, would totally ad lib, and it wasn't it wasn't like a one four five. And and uh, John Lee Hick- Hooker did. Uh, some of that too, but this guy was even more so, uh, furry, furry Lewis, and uh, um, not many people know about furry Lewis, but um, he was the oldest uh, blue, living blues legend on the planet. And I played with him at the in New Orleans, and and uh, anyway, so. Well, well, I guess my my idea there is, uh, you know. It seems to me I'm looking at like the chronology here. When you uh, when you were in Berkeley, um, were, were guys like Garcia and Weir were they coming to these uh, these blues shows? How did you reconnect with Bobby uh, after that time? That's a very interesting question. I'm glad you asked that question because um, a lot of people don't know this. Um, I was in my old '57 beat up. Uh, 57 Volkswagen bug and um, and um, in Palo Alto and I was on my way up to San Francisco uh, I have no idea what what my mission was but I can sort of imagine and um, and lo and behold uh, there was a hitchhiker and it, it, was, it was it right I remember the exactly where I picked him up and it was uh, the main on ramp going from uh, uh, University Avenue, um, going on to the 101, going to San Francisco, and and I've stopped and picked this guy up, and and we started talking, and then I said, well, where are you going? He said, going to uh, uh, Ashbury. Uh, I, I said, well, I, I don't. I said, I don't really know where that is. He said, well, he said, well, I'll show you. And it, and it turns out it was 710 Ashbury, and it was uh, Hunter. I picked up <laughs> <laughs> Robert Hunter on hitchh- yeah. hitchhiking on the on the on the freeway. I mean that to me, serendipity with Matt Kelly just reigns supreme. I mean that. So you, uh, you but you were unaware of 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 seven ten, and did you did that day? Did you get out of the car and go in and hang for a while? Oh, of course. Yes. And then he told me. He said, you know, I I was not the Grateful Dead were 
just getting rolling and and Pig Ben was still in the band and it was it was it was certainly not the Grateful Dead that most people know it was the old Grateful the old original Grateful Dead and um I was doing that's when I was doing my own thing in Santa Cruz with all these other people and um which I won't go into because it, uh, it's just too complicated. Uh, and so, yeah, and uh, so I went in, and um, and Bobby and I, you know, caught up, you know, because it's been so many years since we've seen each other. And uh, during that time, I, I, uh, like I said, I'd been living in England. I had made a record uh, with a band called Gospel Oak. Uh, we were, our manager was the guy, one of the guys that was. Uh, help start the Beatles. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't a very good record, um, but there was some interesting songs on it. It's just the, the quality of the musicianship wasn't that great. Um, uh, had it been done differently, it could have been a really good record, but anyway, it was what it was. Uh, but uh, so... Um, yeah. So did you did I guess here's did you when you got it must have been amazing to reconnect. But did you guys like how quickly after that did you start jamming with going up there and playing with them? Ah, well, that didn't happen. Let's see. Uh, I was involved with um, uh, David Torbert. You um, know, yeah, right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, with bands in, in, in the Santa Cruz area and the Los Altos area and and this is before the new writers and everything and, and um, so uh, eventually uh, uh, I, I ended up on this I'm not it, it's so convoluted I, I, I can't tell the whole story which is the whole thing would take hours and everyone tells me I need to write a book but uh, I, I just uh, I don't know if I can. Uh, what kind of music? Act. What kind of music were you? Don't you don't have to to apologize for anything. What 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 kind of music was your? What were you and Torbert playing at that time? Well, we were doing. I learned, Torbert was kind of like my mentor. I learned so much from him. He, he was so supportive because I I really uh, was insecure about my musical ability and. Uh, and he he say, "Come on, Kelly, man, you can you go, you great, you got so much soul." He said, "What are you talking about?" You know, and, and he just and he was like my brother. You know, I mean, he was the closest thing to a real bro that I'd ever had. You know, mm -hmm. and he was so supportive. And uh, so we were doing everything from Merle Haggard to, uh, you know, um, it, it was very eclectic to to, to blues to to old time rock and roll things like Sea Cruise and uh, uh, Willie and the Hand Jive, right. which the new writers recorded. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, some of this stuff's kind of corny, but um, and then and then Torbert wrote a lot of his own material too. Some of it was really some of the songs that I thought were superb. Um, his originals. Um, if you listen to the lyrics, um, and um, so. Anyway, uh, but we then we got separated from and and he ended up in in Hawaii and I ended up in England uh, playing with uh, doing this gospel oak thing. Then that broke up and I ended up playing with Champion Jack Dupree, uh, who was you know a, a classic. You know he was um, and I did and that was really fun because that was just Champion Jack and I traveling around in his, in in the champion jack mobile you know and and, and we traveled all around england um and um i couldn't get a work permit to go to europe to, we were going to do the, these festivals in europe so finally i ended up going back to the states and 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 then, then i started i'm i'm really jumping through this quickly because uh uh, it, there's too much information, um, but I ended up um, getting back with Johnny Carswell, and um, we uh, started we started playing the Chitlin circuit in 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 the Midwest and the South, and uh, it was 
an experience I'll never forget. I mean, we had some incredible gigs. We had an amazing guitarist. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of the people in those times, he had a substance abuse problem that was severe and, and kind of lost things up. But um, but playing with Johnny and, and, and some of the clubs we played, it was like right out of... Uh, uh, right out of the you know late twenties or something. Right, I remember uh, talking to a, a piano player, uh, a great, a good friend of mine, Mike Longo, who grew up in uh, in in, uh, in Florida, and he went on the Chitlin circuit, and he was talking about playing these boogie woogie tunes with the floorboards literally coming out of the floor because people were dancing so much, you know, and it was just yeah. it was just it was the and uh, it almost seems like. Uh, it, yeah, so the, I had no idea you even played that, that you went down into the... Ch- this is really confounding to me. I, I'm curious as to what these guys... They must have just enjoyed the uh, your uh, your innocence and, and your individual style. I mean, and I, I think it maybe probably goes back to your what you talked about earlier with the drum, the, the rhythmic playing. It must have really blended well with them. I, you know, it, that's, a, that's a good question. I... Uh, to this day, I don't know why, you know, why they would pick me. You know, there's a lot of good harp players out there, but, uh, you know, somehow, you know, I was the, they really liked me. And I remember uh, uh, playing, it was the middle of winter, and we'd play these old coal mining towns in Kentucky, and, uh, and the owner took me in the back room, and he had this big roll of, of $100 bills and, and a one of those old fashioned 45 automatics, you know, right out of the, the movies, you know, and then there's this big 300 pound guy. And he said, he said, don't worry, boy, we're, we're not prejudiced around here. And, and, you know, if you like any of our women, just help yourself. And he said, and I sure do love that harp. And, and he, he slapped a 20 in my hand. He said, I, now this is for you to go up. I want to just hear that harp, you know, and he just, every time we play there, we didn't play there a lot, but, uh, he he take me inside and 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 make sure that I that he tip me in and I, that I played the harp. Uh, they wanted me just to play the harp, and uh, so uh, it, it was a uh, um, it was it was a real adventure. And and but then finally it got it got a little bit uh, nasty and scary because uh, of the, the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, we got, uh, I got, um, my life threatened, uh, way, num- a lot of times, wow. uh, and it got to be a little bit too much. And, um, and we finally decided that it was, we, none of us, it wasn't worth the risk anymore. So, um, uh, that was the last time I saw Johnny I and mean, we were really close and we hugged each other and, uh, and never saw him again. But then all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, 25 years ago, because it was right after I got married, um, and that was 25 years ago, uh, I got this phone call from Alaska, and it was Johnny. And uh, he was playing up in Alaska. And, and I, we just and we both were crying on the phone, you know, <laughs> everything it was really an emotional reunion, you know, because... Uh, there was a lot of love there, and uh, you know we we've been through so much together. I and uh, um, do you you wouldn't by any chance know whatever happened to Johnny, would you? Um, I can absolutely find out for you, uh, and 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 we'll get into it. But I I'm actually yearning for a little bit of harp playing as well. So I'm gonna play another tune for you, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll come back and and revisit. Okay. You go go for it, yeah. Thank you. 
November 5th, 1980. The Palace... That must have been Kim, Kim Mock on guitar, right? That's Bobby Cochran, baby. That's Bob... Yeah. That's Bobby Cochran? 11 5 1980, the Palace Theater, Waterbury, Connecticut. You want to talk about pull, oh. pulling one out of the vaults there for Bob Weir Band. That was Matt Kelly, Bobby Cochran, Dave Torbert, Brent Midland, and uh, Billy Cobham on drums. Um, and Bobby Cochran, oh. you know, that's a supplication. <laughs> I mean, that, to me, that was because it was so funny. I mean... It, it, there's just too much to cover, but it, that 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 band. I mean, I was cranking that last night at home. My wife's like, "Turn that down," you know. But I, I mean, that stuff still holds up so well today. Talk, talk a little. I'm bit. blown away. I can't believe it. It's a, it's amazing to listen to listen to that because, uh, for one thing, that that's a that's a tough because it's eleven. It's in, in the time of eleven four eleven four timing, and. Uh, it's not an easy song to do live, and and uh, that was a good version that you just played, and and uh, I think in I'm mailing you a copy of it. I have I have a treasure trove. Of, I mean, because it's interesting because there's so much out there. Um, I tried to find some some really good Kingfish stuff, which really is some a, a band that you had a major major role in. Um, and, uh, you know, the mixes weren't that great. Even this is an it's kind of a a, a, mu a muddy audience recording. But the point is that. Um, I just would love for you, for me, really, to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how exciting and how fun it must have been to bring in, uh, you know, already having a relationship, musical relationship with Bobby, and then being able to fuse that with Brent, and then bring in a guy like Billy Cobham um, and, uh, you know, Al Johnson or, you know, Dave Torbert, and, and, uh, and fuse that together and play really heavy heavy music i just would love you to take me through that if you would well um the the sequence that you just listed it's uh it's hard for me to to blend it all because um torbert for, for one thing david torbert um played a very small role in in when cobham came in um Torbert was basically sort of on his way out, mm -hmm. and and uh, and don't get me wrong, I you know I I, I love Torbert, and um, and uh, it, it wasn't all that long after that that he passed away, and uh, uh, but he he had a, 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 let's see what what happened after that uh, I can't remember. I can I can fill in the I can fill it in probably better because I've interviewed Bobby Cochran and he basically said that you know uh, Bobby and 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 Al Johnson and Billy Cobham were doing a lot of clinics and seminars and and one day uh, Bob Bobby and and uh, Bobby Cochran and Bob we were talking and he said wouldn't it be fun to have those guys as a rhythm section but Al was a little skittish for a variety of reasons uh, he kind of made lists of his lists of his lists and uh, and, and obviously you know Weir uh, had a different kind of leadership style so i think al got a little <laughs> al got a little bit of cold feet but that that reason i like that you're right torbert was a fleeting member but uh, and brent eventually you know once he became established with the dead he dropped out but i, I he left the bob weir band but i just love the fact that those that, that you guys were all together and, and really just having a lot of fun. Really, that's what it just sounds like to me, you know? Yeah, it was, well, it was a really interesting, uh, eclectic um, group of guys that, from completely different backgrounds. Uh, you know, you take Al, uh, Alfonso Johnson and Billy Cobham and, and uh, Bobby Cochran and Torbert and myself and we are, I mean, each one of us it would come from completely different backgrounds, you know. So, uh, um, but it kept it, it kept changing around the, the members because, um, uh, like Al Alphonse uh, wasn't the first player. It was it was, bass player. It was the guy from Vanilla Fudge. I forget his name. Um, uh, was the, was was the original bass player for Bobby and the Midnight's, and then. Um, I can't remember whether he quit or got fired or, uh, but, uh, but anyway, he left the band and then Alphonse came on, um, and was on for the record. And, uh, he was, uh, uh besides being a hell of a musician, um, he was a really, uh, fantastic 
human being, you know, and every, and, and so was, uh, uh, um, Billy Cobham, you know, uh, he had a great sense of humor and, and, uh, I, I just couldn't believe I was, that I was actually playing with these guys. These guys are, you know, were so out of my league I, that I just, <laughs> I thought, well, what kind of dream, when am I going to wake up, you know, uh, kind of thing. But, um, uh, it was an adventure, and another part of the puzzle, uh, this bizarre, uh, like say, eclectic puzzle that uh, that kept evolving and changing, and uh, um, and that went on for years. I mean, in, in different configurations and different names, and uh, so on and so forth, and. Uh, uh, I like I said I don't know what 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 you know and what you don't know and and uh, you know I, I see uh, once in a while I go on the internet and I'll see people selling stuff on uh, on a black market as kingfish uh, at uh, at places that uh, um, uh, like uh, what was that place in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, uh, that was so famous where Yorma uh, tuna started. It was the Catalyst, um, the Catalyst, or something? No, well, the Catalyst was downtown Santa Cruz. This was up in the mountains. Um, you know, was, you know what I want to know. I, what I really want to know is because I was looking forward. I, like, how did you, um, did you and and Billy Cobham talk about the? I mean, I just love the fact that it says Matt Kelly harp vocals congas. And I'm like, did you guys? How did? What songs did you play congas on? And how? How great was it to work with, with, I mean, Cobham, Mahavishnu, I mean, Billy Cobham to me is like, and the guy had jazz chops, he had everything, and then he sort of, with Mahavishnu, reinvented the sound of drums for better or for worse, rock music became extremely loud, and then I'm looking now, you know, fast forward six years, and Matt P- Kelly's playing conga drums with Billy Cobham, and I'm like, how did that, what songs would you play on, and how did you guys work that out? I just, to me, that's where I, that's where I lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're really stretching it now. Uh, the, the thing is, is, is I hadn't played congas in years. It's like, remember I, when I told you in the beginning, you know, that's, that's all I played was congas. I, I, I hadn't even started playing harp or guitar. And, and then I, I, I played congas and, uh, but it, I can never say that congas were, was my, was my main instrument. Uh, uh, I mean, I never really got, uh, that proficient on the conga drums, uh, um, like people usually associate me as a harp player, you know, harp rhythm guitarist. And that's primarily, uh, harp rhythm guitarist, songwriter, um, is basically how people would probably categorize me that are familiar with my career. But uh, how, uh, let's see, the question again. Uh, the, the, question, did, the question was what song would you, how would the, like how would Billy create space within his playing to allow the conga drum to even be heard? With it? What songs would you play? Uh, I, I don't remember the names of the songs. It was a, just, uh, you know, I would just play um, very, uh, my style was to really just hold down, I, I wasn't one of these guys, I mean, Cobham was, uh, our styles were um, very, very different, because he, he was a very complex player, mm-hmm. uh, and my my playing is is just the opposite. I, I I'm there. I hold down the rhythm, um, and keep, just keep it there in the pocket. Um, and um, so it's not like there's a lot of conga drum players that do some really amazing. They have amazing chops and do amazing stuff. It's, it's just not the way I played. And and I I, I and I'm I. I got to tell you, I, I was never, um, you know, a, a phenomenal conga drum player. I was, I had a, a great sense of rhythm, and I was a good, I was good at what I did, and 
Um, but um, I, uh, I, I can't think of the name of a song. Okay, well, I'll have uh, to do some more. That's fine. Uh, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what you were naturally good at was uh, the, uh, the harp and, and, and there's a, 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 another piece of music here I want to play. It's a little bit, a little bit long, um, but, uh, it's well worth the wait and, uh, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Goes into his manic slide guitar playing. That was Matt. Like, 
<laughs> the rhinoceros and the mating with a with an elephant uh, or whatever they were. So somebody had some uh, metaphor for uh, Bobby's uh, slide playing on that song. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> it, was a, it was a rhinoceros mating with a what? With an elephant I or something. I love it. I just, you know, I mean... That was uh, July 14th, 1984, at the Greek Theater in Berkeley, California. Um, who, who was playing? Well, who were the other musicians? Um, that was you with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> that was you with, uh, with, with the guys at the Greek. Saturday night show. Uh, and at one point, actually twice, Bobby, during the song, he goes, that's Mad Boy. And then at the end, uh, he says, uh, he introduces you as you left the stage. That was Mac, and he's like, that's Matt Kelly. That was um, from the Greek Theater in 1984. And in fact, just to tweak your memory, um, several times in 84 and then uh, early 85 in March uh, in, at both the Berkeley Community Theater and then in, in Nassau Coliseum in Long Island, you wound up playing harp on a few songs, Spoonful and Minglewood and Superstitious. Um, and what's really cool about that is it is really a, a, one of my it's like my favorite period of the Grateful Dead only because they had gone through the Ken Kesey, they had gone through the jazz and the psychedelia and the, and the beauty and the perfection. And then you were looking at sort of the underbelly of the beast with, even though Bobby was in great health, Phil called those years, the Heineken years. And, <laughs> and Jerry was, I mean, Jerry, I don't even know how he lived. I mean, I, I don't, yeah. you know, and, and I, and I wonder uh, where you were at at that time and, and if, what kind of relationship you had with Garcia because he was he was not doing well at that point, even though his playing was fantastic. I mean, the guy was, he was hurting. it Best you can, uh, take me back into that, to the murky depths of, of the early 80s for Matt Kelly. Well, uh, the murky depths, that's a... That's a, a good way of, of describing it, um, uh, especially because uh, I, I particularly remember uh, Nassau. Um, I don't know if you remember there was an incident that happened. Cause it was all over the internet uh, where Mickey was throwing his drumsticks at me. Did you hear about that? Read about that? Can you talk about, about that a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, do, uh, do you, you know about that? I've never heard of that. No. <laughs> well, it, it was on the. It was, somebody called me up and they said you should check out YouTube because um, there's this big thing about uh, all all these people have written in telling their version of what they saw at at NASA and would make you throw his drumsticks at you. And I went, I said that's on YouTube all these years later, and and they said yeah, and apparently. Um, how it came to pass was uh, Mickey had just recently um, um, uh, beaten up uh, their their bus driver or something who was an old man. Oh, Mick! And, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he's a. I mean, I I don't like to speak ill of anybody, but but Mickey was um, he had this, this streak in him. Uh, uh, sort of, sort of psychotic, um, and not sort of. It was psychotic because I, I mean, it happened so many times that there's no other way to describe it. And it happened with me three on three different occasions. And I'm, I'm a pretty mellow, easy to get along with type of guy. And um, and what happened to me uh, that that particular no, I'm not going to tell the other stories but what happened to me that particular night was um, uh, both Jerry and Brant and uh, Weir all wanted me to play on that black hat whatever it is black hat bones or whatever it is and um, and a couple of other ones and they said yeah we really want to harp on that and I and I I said I'd be happy to, you know, and I was feeling good that night. And um, uh, I was why were you Why were you in Long Island, by the way? Um, I was visiting a friend, um, 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. No, no, it's, uh, I, I grew up in Stony Brook, so I was like, I don't think, I don't know, Matt, did Matt relocate? It's not important. Please, so you got up there and maybe Mickey went, just the insecurity or the psychosis, he just started throwing the sticks at you? Well, no, the, we, <laughs> I, it, this, we, I have history with Mickey, and I, I think basically it comes back to to way back in, in, in the beginning, in the early days when uh Kingfish, uh, uh, Rock Scully was our manager, and he thought that we, that uh, Chris Harold, our drummer, wasn't cutting it, and we needed a new drummer. And and I said, no, this is a big mistake because, um, it, you know, Chris, you know, there are better drummers out there, but the chemistry uh, of Chris playing, and Chris was a good drummer. He just uh, there were certain things he did really well and certain things, um, yeah, that he could have done better, but the, but it would have it changed the whole, it would have changed the whole chemistry of the band. I was really against it and so was everybody else. And so Mick, Mickey came up to audition and, um, Mickey, as you know, is a percussionist. He's not a drummer. He's not a real drummer. He, he did play drums for the new writers at one point in the very beginning and they, Finally, got rid of him because he didn't wasn't working. He even played drums with the Grateful Dead in the very, very, very beginning. He played some drums, but that wasn't working. So they found it, found uh, Billy, B- right? And and so um, anyway, getting back to the story, uh, uh, I had some other run-ins with with him um, where um, you know, and where he was trying to. Uh, be uh, like a bully and I just said look Mickey I said look I'm not into this kind of thing if you want to pick on somebody you know uh, you know this is not the time or the place you know and uh, um, I I, I know how to take care of myself and uh, um, I was a rugby player like I said I was a captain of the football team I was uh, the boxer, and uh, I, I would have annihilated him, and uh, and I just, but I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not a violent person, and but anyway, getting back to the situation, he 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 said, well, uh, you're not getting up on the stage, and I said, well, he said, Mickey, um, I normally would, uh, you know, you know, if you if I thought you felt so strongly about it, I wouldn't do it, but. Um, there's all the other guys in the band uh, feel very strongly that they do want me to play, and I said I would, and so I've got to keep my my word. And he said, well, you're going to be sorry, and he was really threatening, I mean, really threatening me, like, you know, you're going to be, I mean, big time. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I I can't even repeat some of the things that he said, but it was very ominous. And I just said, okay, well, you know, do if you want to, do, you can do it, do your worst, whatever you're going to do. But I'm going to play anyway. So I went up there and played, and all of a sudden I felt, I felt this thing go, Whoa, you know, right by my ear, and and um, and he's throwing drums. St- I mean, really heavy drumsticks at me. And what I my first thought was, um, the kids um, in the front row, you know, they could get their eyes put out. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I was this is very un- concerned. Oh God, Wait, huh? so this is. Um, I mean, and you're saying that 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 some friends called you because it's on YouTube. The the footage. You is- you. Oh. Yeah, and then people, uh, you know, everyone wrote wrote in and their opinion of what ha- of what they saw happened. And and uh, one thing I forgot, I had just come back from India, so from a meditation retreat. So I was in the very sort of um, uh, very spiritually. Uh, sort of um, mo- modality, so to speak, and and um, and apparently how it ended was um, well, two things happened that 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 I that I noticed from that was brought to my attention um, from, that were that were really interesting. Number one was that Bobby. Uh, while Beer, Billy was throwing these drumsticks at me, he he hit me a couple of times uh, on the back. Um, it, it it wasn't devastating; it hurt, but it was not a big deal. Um, uh, but then Bobby, unbeknownst to me, stepped in to 
to block the blows so, so that it would hit him instead of me. And uh, I didn't know that until until just this last year when when you know somebody you know <clears throat> sent me the YouTube. And I I wrote Bobby an email. I said, Bobby, you've done a lot. You've really been there for me as a friend in so many different ways. I wrote him a letter uh, when I quit Rat Dog and and told him uh, sort of a farewell because I didn't know when I was going to see him again. And um, our lives were going in very different directions. Um, as you know, I, I run a, I've been running a foundation now working with refugees and and children and and uh, from from Burma and, and from all over. And anyway, it was so touching. I mean, I, I I mean, it brought tears to my eyes when I saw that. And 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 I, I like I said, I wrote him a long email. And uh, although I'd said it all before, when I left the band, I I, I wrote him uh, an email and and said everything uh, that. Over that it happened, there are different highlights that happened with us over the years that that were that he did for me that that were uh, over and about above the bound, the bounds of 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 what friends do for one another, and, and he's really been there for me, and I wanted him to know that, um, and so I let him know, and no one's in terms in my. Uh, other email, but anyway, I, I want to finish the story about uh, uh, what happened uh, is, and then at the very end, uh, the song ended. The lights went down, and um, you know, I've got a temper, and fortunately, I, uh, like I said, I just come back from this ashram in India, and and uh, in, instead of doing something stupid and you know, going up there and just grabbing him and throwing off his drumsticks, uh, his drum set or something uh, stupid. I I went up and gathered all his drum sticks that he'd thrown to to me, uh, thrown at me. Picked them all up, um, uh, bowed like you do in in India, you know, with a namaste kind of thing. Absolutely. Handed handed him his drumsticks and, and walked away. And I got so much positive feedback from the from the crowd, the, pe- the people that wrote in YouTube. So uh, um, I was happy with my response because uh, you know we all have, as Carl Jung says, uh, we have our uh, shadow side, and and I've got that too. But uh, fortunately, that night I I, I felt I handled it uh, with great equanimity and and. Um, but Mickey can be, he's, I don't know what his problem is. He's got, he's a real bully and mm-hmm. he's, a, he can be a real asshole and to beat up this old man for what, you know, and it's not the first, and he's got a reputation for, for doing this, but I, I don't want to get, no, I know and, and you know, I just want to, I want to ask you cause you know, because I was talking to my friend yesterday, a, a drummer and, and we were, I mean, for the first time I'm really able to listen to the dead and delineate and really hear Kreutzmann swing the band. And we just we determined that Mickey was essentially, uh, you know, just a uh, polyrhythmic percussionist. Um, That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and my question is, I just I just want to ask you, anybody else in the dead like that, really? I just can't see it. I can't see Brent or – was Billy – I mean, they all, they all obviously had, had streaks. But was anybody as overtly bullish as Mickey Hart? No. I had. I, I didn't mean. I didn't. I'm sorry. I don't want to take it into a negative place. Are you but, kidding me? Yeah. You, no, you don't have to apologize for anything. But ending on this note, my my engineer stepped in when, when Little Red Rooster was playing, and he and he mentioned that he saw you play with Rat Dog, uh, uh, in as late as uh, I think the late '90s. And and I just wanted to ask you about your feelings about stepping away from the whole scene and going on this this extremely holistic mission uh, that you're on but really not so much the mission of but more stepping away from from this this enclave that you were part of for decades um it's that's an, i'm really happy you asked that question it's just it's like um <clears throat> That chapter of my life, it's like I woke up one morning, I I was making really good money uh, uh, 
uh, at the time, and I had no idea what I was going to do, um, or what, where I was going to move, or I, I had no idea. All I knew was that it was time for me to do something else, and um, uh, I just had to, as uh, Joseph Campbell said, you know, you follow your bliss, and I knew there was something else out there waiting for me. I didn't have a clue what it was. Um, but the next day I, I, I was, I called the guys together and we had a, a meeting and, and I said, you know, I love you guys. I love playing with you because I really enjoyed all the guys in Rat Dog as, as, as individuals. So you can say, you know, a lot of people didn't like the band and it had its faults and stuff. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, not to be, the music or any of that. I'm just talking about playing with them and, uh, it, you know, as as human beings, they were all great. They all are great individuals and great people. And uh, I just, it was, a, it was a really neat time for me to be able to play with them. And, uh, but uh, be that as it may, I, 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 something inside me and I, um, I still, you know, who knows where and how these things come about, but I just knew that it was time time to move on. And a lot of people told me I was crazy. They said, Kelly, you're out of your mind. you got this great gig. You're playing with Weir and, you know, all these great musicians and, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, yes, I know all that, but i it's, I got to do something else. And so um, anyway, I told the guys very politely that um, – um, I love them, and that, uh, but I had to move on, and it's the best decision I ever made in my life. And uh, um, my, uh, I've never once thought, "Gee, I wish, uh, wish I had stayed in the band," or uh, "I sure do miss that." Uh, I, um, there, there's, there's nothing. Um, I think it was. Uh, Dr. Uh, Albert Schweitzer said the luckiest man on earth is is the one that is able to be of service to to others to a fellow man and and you don't know that till you've actually experienced it and you know we when when I started this thing uh, with my it was just my wife and I. Uh, we started on a very grassroots level. We hardly had any money, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we but we've built it and watched it grow and blossom, <clears throat> and um, it's been a huge success. And uh, we've changed, touched the lives of you know literally. Um, um, thousands. Matt Kelly, you've been you've been giving off good vibes for many years and I think the intersections going up, playing with Johnny Carswell and Mel Brown, pl- going to England, uh it's always been about timing. It's always been about um, you know, the your gut instinct and I think that that is the most refreshing thing and quite honestly, uh I can't thank you enough for taking the time and and we'll be in touch to set up another time just for the audience's understanding it's almost 3 in the morning in Thailand right now so I want I want Matt to get get some sleep his ribs are probably killing him right now. Oh yeah I'm fine with it but I uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Much love to you. Thank you for taking the time, brother. Yeah, yeah well, thanks for having me. Matt Kelly, thank you so much and we'll talk soon, brother. All right, thank you. All right now. It's been a, pl- been a real pleasure. Me too. Okay. Take care. Good. Bye-bye. The Jake Feinberg Show. See you all in a little bit.